will, will you find? Oh yeah. Uh, even in the summer, a front-wheel drive uh, Mazda CX-3. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. like I said, but, but it, but and but still, and that's part of why it surprises me because you're right. We don't need them much here, up here at all. But it's part of the image, which is why I was surprised when I found out how many of those are sold just front-wheel drive. You know, once you get south. But you know, you know, Subaru bit the bullet years ago, and they went yeah. all all-wheel drive, and they've made it a selling point, and everybody and, knows that. And, and, and it would seem to make very sense well for them. Right. I mean, right. How much do they need to advertise a price leader? You know, right. Certainly on a Cherokee. Well, I mean, I just wonder how much money, like I, I said, you're, you're going to make it up on premiums. I mean, yes, you're going to lose some customers who are basically going to say, gee, for that money I could buy a, you know, a loaded Equinox. You know, I mean, because they yeah. want, you know, because they want the amenities. They don't yeah. want the, you know, go anywhere, do anything sort of thing. But, you know, if you think about it, I mean, you, you, you your messaging becomes all the more focused. Oh, I agree with you. I, and you're... Manufacturing process and, and your bill of materials mm -hmm. get simpler and smaller too. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's an argument there's a lot that to be said for it. If you're if you're Fiat Chrysler, that what you do is, uh, yeah, all of your Jeeps are uh, four wheel drive of some sort, and um, for those who only need two wheel drive, you've got Dodge SUVs and and Fiat SUVs. Yeah. For that matter, you know. Yeah. But if you're well. I that guess, makes sense. I, hey. I guess pretty much. Oops. <laughs> we're, we're getting down to the. Carmen, should I go now? Boilerplate. Hang tight. There's a few. Oh, okay. We're kicking the gremlins out of the system. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I, and the I think it was I... you a long time ago. Didn't you do a story? Somebody, I remember, did a story on way 15, 20 years ago, maybe, on, on the fact that if Ford just got rid of all of the grades and all of the options on what would have been the Focus, uh, sorry, the Escort probably at the time, that they could have made them all the highest level of equipment and still ha had a lower cost overall, too. Is that right? Huh, yeah. I remember somebody doing that. Well, I guess you know, it wasn't you. Yeah I, mean, I, yeah, I don't think it was me, but yeah, build complexity. I mean, the, the manufacturing yeah. people hate it. Although, Mark Royce gave me a great quote. He said, you know, build complexity is not a problem as long as the customer is willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a really good point. <laughs> and, and if you're making money off yeah. it, what the heck? And the flip side is you also have to look at, say, for example, uh, Honda. If you look at the grades, the grade levels that they had for their two big cars, their Accord and their Civic over the years, where the, they went for many, many years with just uh, three trim levels, right. and now they have so many, and you know, uh, EXL, EXL, or EX, yeah. EXL means leather, and then you know, it, it used to be that you didn't have that much to choose from; you just chose a color, right. and do you want the higher grade with the uh, sunroof, and it's. Yeah. Way more than that. Remember, for but a Honda's of, relatively simple compared to a lot of others still even, though. Right. right? Yeah. They are. Yeah. But you yeah. remember, Toyota and Honda and Nissan, for that matter, for I, a couple of decades, did not even put air conditioning in the factory. They would do it at the port of entry right. mm -hmm. because everybody yeah. in the United States wants car, uh, air conditioning. Yeah. But at that time, in the rest of the world, people didn't care so much. Yeah. yeah. But throughout yeah. the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, even into the 90s, they that put lady. the air conditioning in at the port wow. in the U.S., and and presumably some of the I, I think uh, some of those uh, air conditioning systems were, you know that's the one thing that in the 80s the the American brands were still doing much better than the Japanese brands. They just, mm -hmm. you know, yep. didn't have good air conditioners. It's like I've, I've been reading this book on uh, the the famous Beetle advertising and, and reading all oh, yeah. those those old ads through the years and uh, and it's remarkable how one of the um, points they, they make over and over in the ads is how little the car changed over the years and that this was this was actually a benefit. A selling point. Uh, exactly. Wow. And 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 it was making you know and it's like, you know, we've we've just gotten better and better by doing the same thing over and over. <laughs> and and oh by the way, our spare parts are are much cheaper. And you know you're able to you know buy all of these parts for you know and it, it was it was wonderful to see that, you know, here is a here is a point in time where they're just saying, okay, we don't change the car. They mentioned they didn't mention that they didn't change the car since the 1930s. Basically, yeah, well. <laughs> they they kind of skipped past that part. Right. But uh, yeah, I remember those those ads, and of course, that came in an era in which um, uh, American cars, especially GM cars, had all new sheet metal basically every two years, body mm -hmm. on frame mostly. 
uh, made that easy. But, uh, you know, just... Actually, uh, in, throughout the 50s and into the 60s, it was every single year. Mm. Well, would, every and, single... Typically, they would change... But not everything, necessarily. Not everything, yeah. You might do the front end and then the rear end, and then you yeah. get a whole new body, and then the front end and the rear end, and right, then a new right. body. Yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't like they did it every 12 months. They were still planning three years in advance. Right, mm -hmm. right. But, yeah, I mean... Uh, the market's proven. Whoever has the freshest stuff out there has the best sales. That's true. Yeah. See, but I wonder if, if part of that is predicated on if you have something fresh, then you promote it. Okay. Huh. Okay. So think about it. I mean, so if you have something that's existing, you're not going to promote it very much, right? But you've you're got the. Do what? You're not going to promote it because it, it, it's there. You know, I mean, it's well, just like, but that's one of the conundrums because, I mean, is it chicken or egg that the, the sales go down because it's existing or because you stop promoting it? Right. You know, you know but everybody budgets. Okay, we'll do the. Okay, I want to thank everybody who's been sitting here Sorry. watching us. We're going to get going with a great show. We've got a lot of great topics to get into here uh, because we've been off for the last couple of weeks. And uh, as you're listening to our discussion, we welcome your your comments and questions, shoot us an email, send it to viewermail at autoline.tv, or you can call in that number, 620-288-6546, and we're going to get going right now. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. All right, we're back in the studio doing Auto Line After Hours. Gary, I got to tell you, I've been jonesing, man. I've, I've been it's, missing it's, this it's, show. It's been, it's been a long time, but it's not like we haven't been busy while we've not been here. It's been crazy. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss. And, and we'll get into that in a minute, but we got to let everybody know that Mark Phelan, the auto critic from the Detroit Free Press, is here in the studio. Great having you, Mark. Thank you, John. And uh, Todd Laza from Automobile Magazine, making a repeat appearance. Thanks, John. So, great having you here, too, Todd. So, yeah, Gary, where do we start? I mean, so I, we should start from CES because that was where we were first. Okay. So, at the very beginning of the year, that's the first automotive event that kicked off 2018. The formerly known as Consumer Electronics Show, just CES. And, uh, they, they dropped it? The initials don't really stand oh, for anything it, anymore? Yeah, because Consumer Electronics, they felt limited. I didn't them. realize that. You know, as you start, as we'll get into in the discussion now, when you start talking about autonomous cars and stuff, you know, is that really Consumer Electronics? Yes, yeah. I, not really. Thanks, but anyway, they, they, they've dropped that. They just call it CES now. So, 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 the, so the big point of contention with CES is that the following week the Detroit Auto Show or the North American International Auto Show occurs. And now you maintain, John, that CES is eating the lunch of I think it's hurting the Detroit, Detroit show. show. I don't think there's any question about it. There were a number of automakers, Hyundai and Kia come to mind right off the top of my head, Nissan, uh, I'd have to go through the whole list, but a number of automakers chose to unveil either production models and or concept cars at CES, several of which never made it to the Detroit show. So, I, yeah, you bet. I think CES is hurting NAIAS. Well, but, but Nissan and, and uh, Toyota Lexus showed concept cars at uh, Detroit. Were these the same ones at CES? All right, so, so, so I, what so exactly I, I, I looked it up. From? I looked it they up. He's, he's sort of right. Okay, okay so, so Toyota... <laughs> I hate when they look it up. <laughs> okay, so, so Toyota showed a concept, yeah. the e-pallet concept, which is basically a, a little... Um, it's a box shuttle, on wheel. Shuttle bus type okay. thing, right. right? Right. And so what the purpose of this thing is, it'll be an electric autonomous vehicle that is also going to be, um, they're partnering with a number of companies, including Pizza Hut and so on, to, to develop this, and they'll have an infrastructure, and they'll be rolling around with this, and, you know, Accio is there. It's and, amazing how much is being put into pizza delivery. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's actually, <laughs> I, I, had, cars. I, I, I had the opportunity to have dinner with a guy who was running Pizza Hut, and, and, and I said to him, I said, you know, 
are, are you guys doing this because Domino's is working with Ford? And he says, no, 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 we've been, we've been trying to get autonomous pizza delivery vehicles for a long time. I'm like, why? You're going to put so many high school kids out of jobs. He said that. And of couple, course, they're not safe drivers, relatively speaking. He said they can't, right? they can't get enough drivers. And he said it's, it's a real problem in terms of, of hiring drivers. And then when they need surge capacity, they certainly can't get it. So you think about Super Bowl or something like that. So they'd have the fleet of autonomous vehicles that they could send out. But and what Domino's will tell you is the cost of the driver drives up the cost of the pizza. Sure. Well, so they, they can cut the cost of the pizza and, and, and what deliver is, it. And what, is, what is very clever is if you think about it, so Ford was showing, um, what is a Fusion that we had the pizza delivery. Yeah, right. Was that it, Domino's? Because didn't uh, Chevy do a, a Sonic that was developed with that was Domino's, Domino's a little while ago? Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so right. Domino's but, is, is too the tiny. The or the X. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, but anyway, so, so this, this e-pallet thing, they were saying that, that basically you could have the pizza oven in the vehicle. So it would be cooking the pizza while it's driving to your your. Place. It's an autonomous pizza stand. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. I think they should start but. with uh, replacing uh, uh, Ubers and Lyft drivers first because then they could get the Uber and Lyft drivers to go work for Domino's and deliver. There you pizzas. go. All right. So there was a Toyota e pallet Hyundai showed the production Nexo fuel cell vehicle, which will be coming out later this year. And then um, the only other vehicle that I was able to find was the Byton. The I'm electric. Sorry, what? <laughs> it, it's the next Chinese it's, Tesla wannabe. It, it, yeah, it was. It was this year's Faraday Future. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, it was a couple. A couple of former BMW guys got together. One of whom spent his career largely in China. And uh, so they decided that they needed to develop a vehicle. And the guy told me, he goes, and we decided it had to be made in China. But see, that's not a concept car. That's a concept company, which was what well, Faraday was. <laughs> yeah. And, well, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll give the, I would give the win, at least from a car guy point of view, even with just three concepts to the uh, Detroit show compared with those. Um, CES concepts. Yeah, and I would say, uh, I'm sorry, Gary. Well, it's only one, please. One concept, two production cars. Yeah, I thought Kia had something there. But I think the fact that you can't remember it yeah. sort of makes my point, which is that, and, and I will admit, I did not go to CES because I was knee deep in getting ready for Detroit. But looking at the coverage you know, coming out of CES from a distance, I didn't see anything that looked like it would even have been a top. 15 headline coming out of Detroit. Yeah. So while it would be you know, nice maybe to have a little bit of extra stuff just so some of the stands were packed with things, I don't feel like you know, the, the Detroit show suffered in any really meaningful way. Uh, and I feel like C CES, it seems like when there's a breakthrough that you can tell people about, that's a, an electronics breakthrough. That's a great show to do it. First yep. voice recognition. First time an autonomous car drives across the country. Mm -hmm. But in between breakthroughs, it seems like there's a lot of kind of, you know, one turn of the dial to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 like, like Mark, I didn't go this year. I went last year, so I did my time. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, 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 I agree. I mean, there, there was this... Uh, flurry of of autonomous car technology and similar things uh, connected car v, v2 car and all that uh, two three four years ago that seemed to make CES the next big thing for car shows and and that made CES big enough to kick around Detroit and move it back a week because CES moved back a week but I and, don't think I'm sorry go oh. No, I was just going to say, I don't know that it was necessarily because of a conflict, because they always have been sort of paired CESs before, right. and, they, and they move through the calendar kind of in sync. You know, So next year, both of them will be closer to, to New Year's, right. I, I would imagine. Okay, but, 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 no, but no, pretty much the same dates. Is it really? Yeah, right. That's interesting. Yeah. See, Boy, I, the, I've heard that CES kind of uh, moved, I, wanted to move away from New Year's a little bit. It did. Right? It did, and, and next year's dates are almost the same as this year's dates. That's okay. interesting, because this year was much lower later than the Detroit dealers like, because they lost the public day for Martin Luther King Day, right. which is a huge day for them right. normally because of school and, and government holidays. Right. And, and made, made Martin Luther King Day the main press day, and, and I think there's a little... Uh, sensitive sensitivity to that for good reason too. I, I think. Well, sure. You know, look, Ford uh, and General Motors said, "No way in hell are we going to do events on Martin Luther King Day." So Chevy launched. Is that Silver the excuse they're that, using for doing their stuff the weekend absolutely. before? Absolutely. That's fascinating. That's I hadn't right. heard that. 
No, that's why uh, Chevy introduced the Silverado on Saturday, and I told everybody I hate working on the weekend. And then yep. Sunday, and I told Ford the same thing: I hate working on the weekend. I that's when done, could have done I thought it they on were, Tuesday. I thought Chief they were Joe yeah. Chevy on Tuesday. <laughs> But to get back to CES, because you're okay. also right, <laughs> I, I, you're I, I, also right that Nissan was there in a big way. Carlos Ghosn okay. gave a keynote address, and Ford was there in a big way because but Jim did Hackett. You read Jim right. Hackett's address. I, I watched Jim Hackett's oh address. Oh my God! It, so <laughs> how how bad was it in person? It I mean, it, bad. It, it was didn't read butterflies good. Butterflies and bunny rabbits. It was, <laughs> It was, it was, but I mean, and more so, fluff. But, well, and but he again, went out of his way to prove that he's not a car guy, which he clearly proved from the uh, the address. And um, and for people, who Edward Niedermeyer it, tweeted that, uh, oh, you know, good good on a, a car CEO for saying he didn't grow up with cars. And I'm think, and I responded to Ed, Edward, who who I like and admire. I said, uh, I now I can't wait for the first uh, uh, Silicon Valley CEO to say he or she didn't grow up a computer nerd. Yes. I mean, really. And, and for people who didn't see it, he was basically talking about the need for smart streets and other infrastructure. Right. Yeah. And it was as exciting, I thought it was so, ex so, as exciting as that sounds. And so as new as it sounds. So you, did, you, didn't, you didn't watch the, you, you, gotta, you gotta watch it. You, because, because he while does he's, electrify the screen. Well, the, 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 so, so behind him, there's the city and it's, it's constantly with vehicles and morphing and, and it's, 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 it's very interesting to see that. But, but he, he reminded me very much of, of in, in as this image here shows of, of, of Jim Hackett, the CEO of Ford, reminded me of Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers' <laughs> oh, the neighborhood. Who's, yeah, because he's, he's sitting down, he's not standing up at all. I mean, he walks on stage, sits down, and then he leaves stage, and then uh, uh, Marcy Claghorn comes out, and, and Jim Farley comes out, and uh, well, and was uh, there a talk Don to Butler comes out, and uh, yeah, there could have been. Um, and, it, you know, it is, it is fascinating that it, it wasn't so much about vehicles at all. Farley talked about vehicles a little bit. And, and basically no, it's all the smart city stuff, city of the future, blah, blah, blah. I don't see a business case for the Ford Motor Company. They're talking all this pie in the sky stuff. Meanwhile, their profitability is going down. Wall Street's hammering their stock. They can't show anybody how they're going to make money on all this stuff. Yeah, they, 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 they don't want to be a car company anymore. They call themselves a mobility company, and they're really a truck company. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and we'll get into the trucks in a minute. So, so, I, was like, so I, I looked at this. So there's this guy, Steven Stanofsky, who used to be the president of Microsoft Windows division. Okay, so the guy's got some, some CES credibility, and now he's a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, which you know, is a Silicon Valley-based uh, venture capitalist firm. And, and uh, so he wrote a long piece on CES, and there's one section in this long piece he wrote about uh, autos and transportation. And he writes, even though autos take up about 10% of the show exhibition space, it seems like it takes up about 50% of the show bandwidth. Yeah. So people are talking about this. But then he says, CES and autos are just a weird combination I believe most of what we are seeing at the show is positioning from the big car companies and major supply chain providers and not about really making cars and changing things. The attendees are not the right people and the car companies really don't do business at CES the way that the typical consumer electronics people do. And then to speak to Ford, he says, Ford, not to single them out, of course, but they basically had a vision presentation going on all day that spent a lot of time essentially saying, quote, transportation is messed up. Yep, no argument. This is backed up by Ford announcing a bunch of new internal combustion engine pickup trucks and a new Mustang last week. So it's just like, yeah. right. here, we, here we are at, at CES talking about the bright, shiny future. And oh, by the way, look at the bullet Mustang. Well, and Ford does seem to think that the way to, change, to, to improve their image with people is by talking more about autonomy and, and electric vehicles. Does anybody buy that? I, I mean, those are things you have to have some work on, but is a company's image that important? I don't think they're trying to change the ima image with the public. They're trying to change that image with Wall Street, which, after all, but they, uh, they, rewards well, Tesla. Tesla for not making any money, right? Yeah, but I, so, but I feel like trying to copy Tesla, I, I feel like there's only one Tesla. See, Mark, I would, I would think that Ford's doing the right thing. If it could explain to me and, and the investment community Here's our plan of how to make money off this. Well, they, they, they talk about, well, we, we have this chariot thing, you know, this ride-hailing van, and we're going to have an autonomous ride-sharing service by 2021, and that's it. 
And meanwhile, I think GM is being much more specific mm -hmm. and, and showing how they're integrating this all into their planning, how they've got this architecture that's going to be able to be electrified and autonomized, if there's such a term. And, and so Wall Street's buying it. GM stock yeah. is up strong. Everybody thinks the world of Mary Barra, and Ford just seems to be floundering. They're saying the right things, but they're not explaining how they're going to make money off this. Right. And GM, I, I'm sorry. GM has been more specific. And, and, and as a matter of fact, when they announced that 20 or 22 additional EVs uh, by early, early 2000, uh, 20s, their stock price did bump up quite a bit. Well, Ford still flounders. Well, and I feel like GM is benefiting, but they're benefiting more from a concrete plan and a and concrete movement on the product side too. I, I mean, I, I I don't think we can lose fact uh, lose sight of the fact that I mean it's you know 2018 and Ford still doesn't have a midsize pickup. I mean that seems to be you know indicative of, of a, a kind of a, a lack of ability to execute with the traditional business as no, well. I totally agree, Mark. You know, look. They made a big stink out of the, the Ranger. It's still a year away. It doesn't go into production until the very end of this year. The Echo Sport, which again, you know, compact crossover, they're late to the party. It's been on sale for a month. They haven't advertised or marketed or told anybody about this. Someone and, had it pointed out to me on the, uh, on the Ford showroom floor yeah, at right. NAIA. And isn't that telling? It's on sale, but they haven't asked any of us if we would like to look at it and evaluate it and no, tell the world about today it. Today or tomorrow, they're doing this big thing in New York City with all the social media people. Uh, and they sent me the release. There's not one mention of anything about the vehicle except that it's got Android Auto and Apple CarPlay and blah, 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 that connectivity. And there's nothing else about the vehicle in it. That's because we did the show in L.A. two years ago yeah. on the EcoSport. So right. we, we gave all the information. Well, well we gave the information, <laughs> but, you know, here it is. Uh, we got a picture of it up now. But what's going on at Ford where, you're right, Gary, a year ago, a year ago plus, they told us last the November. Yeah. Now everybody's forgotten about it. They put it in the showroom. They don't tell anybody because all the attention's on the Ranger, which isn't going to be There's here for another year. By and the way. then the Bronco is another year out after that. And is there any evidence that people are crying out for a vehicle like the Bronco anyway? Well, well, just take a look at Jeep sales. Yeah, but Ford Jeep is, is like, a whole special case. Oh, oh I know, but it, all right, I, I, I got a theory about what Ford is doing. Okay, let's. Hear okay, it. so so they made an announcement today about their, they, they've reorganized their mobility services, they bought a couple of other companies that are cloud-based services. I think that what we're gonna see is, is two parts of Ford. One part of Ford is the truck company because that's what they're selling, right? I mean, and a few Mustangs, but, mm -hmm. but by and large, they're, they're selling trucks. The other is going to be a service company and they're gonna have a stream of revenue coming from services. So for example, Hello, you know, Jack Nasser. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, you were talking about Chariot. So I was looking, so they opened this thing with, with Chariot, and I was looking in, in San Francisco. What you basically do is, is you buy a monthly pass or a weekly pass or unlimited rides. And, and you know, so, so here's a revenue stream that is, that is certain because they, you know, you're buying these things. So Ford will make money from that um, and is part of their um, announcement today. They're going to start non-emergency medical transportation. Tapping into the growing healthcare transportation market, Ford Mobility will expand its non-emergency medical transportation operation from a Southeast Michigan pilot with Beaumont Health into a full business serving multiple medical systems. So basically, what are they gonna be doing? They're gonna be picking up people, you See, know, I like older this. people. I like this, because yeah. now you're starting to tell me how you're gonna make money off this Right, stuff. and it's gonna be money off of services. Right. It's not gonna be money off of selling mm -hmm. cars. Yeah. True, and by the way, when you call it a truck company, and when I call it a truck company, I maintain that, well, okay, Okay, we know that they're going to basically get out of the sedan business, just as Fiat Chrysler has. But if you look at their uh, SUV lineup, including the, the late to the party EcoSport or EcoSport, I have to pronounce it a certain way, uh, the, those, a lot of those models that should be key sales models, the, the Explorer, uh, the Escape and so on, are getting way overripe compared with competition. It's all about the pickup truck and, you know, maybe the transit vans. Well, and, and it's all about execution and the ability to make decisions within the company, right. I mm -hmm. think. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it, go on. And just one thing to add, Gary, internally at Ford, they're not calling it services, they're calling it mobility. And they even got a P&L line item 
And they're starting to, not with any hard numbers, but show that they're investing in mobility, mm -hmm. which they explain as one of the reasons why their profitability is down, because they're putting money into that. I've, and because I've been hammering Ford pretty hard, if I can say one good thing about them, yeah. at their presentation at the auto show, at the very end after the you know, Mustang bullet and that whole wonderful family story, Jim Farley almost, by the way, dropped the fact that there's a hybrid F-150 in 2020 and a, and a pure battery electric sports car that he said would be called the Mach 1. Correct. And that name has not been completely set in concrete within Ford. The value of its names better than Ford. And the fact that they're willing to tie two names like that to those two technologies made me take it more seriously than I had until that moment. No, you're right. Uh, Ford's a very strong company. Their balance sheet is a fortress. I mean, they, they've got like $27 billion in cash and securities and like $37 billion in liquidity. So they can spend money if they need to. But you're, you're also right in saying, man, is their product line lame from an age standpoint. Yeah. They got the oldest stuff out there. And the fact that they're doing as well as they are in North America shows me just how good the Ford dealer body is. Oh, yeah. Ford dealer body, you know, as they've said before, they can sell ice cubes to Eskimos. They're really good at moving the metal. And that kind of uh, that that kind of willingness to let things age has, to me, been a long-standing problem at Ford. If you look at the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s with, uh, you know, uh, Taurus and Focus and uh, Lincoln LS all launching really well, but then they get very old very quickly. Look all yeah. the way back to the Model T. Uh, yeah. it's, oh, it's, exactly. You know, exactly. It's yeah. just what the company does. Yeah, they build exactly. a great car and right. they let it right. age into irrelevance. But, but, you know, you got to be competitive yep. and you got to respond to the competition. I can't believe how long it took them to do redo the Expedition and the Navigator. They have like seeded that section of the market to General Motors, which is making a fortune hand over. I think GM has what? It's 70 percent. 70 percent of the full size SUV seg. That's that's criminal. How as Ford Motor Company and Navigator get away with that? the luxury SUV market and then became irrelevant in it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So and now it's the North American. Utility. And the new one is great. I will absolutely say and, and it. It got my vote, yeah. and it was also a free press truck of the year. There's a nice, totally. another nice thing to be said about Ford. Anyway, the Navigator. The Navigator. <laughs> yes. Navigator. Uh, Lincoln it, Navigator. It, it, it oh, served. and names. The Nautilus. No more MKX or whatever they call yeah. that. Yeah. They're going back to names. Right. <laughs> Good. Yes. A great first step. Anyway. So what else, Gary? Well, okay. So, so the before, so, so, I mean, to close up the CES discussion. I mean, so. It, it, it strikes me that it has become less of an automotive show in terms of cars, you know, sheet metal that people will come and see, versus technologies, whether it's, whether it's you know, a cloud-based system that you're communicating with, or it's the suppliers that are there in a big way, whether it's Continental or Bosch or, or Aptiv, or that said. I mean, because they did a very clever thing, so the company formerly known as Delphi, yeah. partnered with Lyft and were offering people rides in autonomous vehicles at CES. Now, there was a safety driver on board and there was a person from the company on board, but, but essentially right. they, they were showing, hey, we're Aptiv, we've got this technology suite that we will then you know, sell to automakers that they can integrate into their vehicles. And so it, 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 it struck me that, remember when the SAE World Congress was like huge in Detroit and it was full, you know, it was, it was almost as big as the auto show in terms of filling Cobo Hall with companies and people from all over the world were coming here and now it's begun to shrink, 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 shrink. So in some ways it's almost that CES is what used to be the SAE World Congress. And, and really a little bit of all, always that way. It wasn't ever about uh, a new Audi showing up. It was about a new Audi showing up on its own with no one at the right. wheel, right? I mean, it's always been that sort of thing. Uh, the, I, I, think, I think maybe it grew more automotively because of all the attention that Silicon Valley has paid to uh, the automotive industry over the last uh, 10 or so years. I mean, you know, everything from just Android, uh, the Android app and the Apple CarPlay uh, to, you know, Google working on autonomous cars right. and so on. Well, it, it's even more than that, because if you're a car company, your stock multiple stinks. 
It's just it. The, the Wall Street doesn't care about car companies. If you're perceived as a tech company, yeah. well, like Tesla, you can lose money all day long, and they, they love you. Your stock price goes up. As long as you don't have your own factories. <laughs> Same with suppliers. So, yeah, Delphi said, hey, our, our multiples aren't going anywhere, even though they had some of the best multiples in the supplier industry. So they said, we got to split this company up, and we're going to leave the old stuff behind, and we'll still call that Delphi, and we're going to take the new sexy stuff, and we're going to call that Aptiv. And you're starting to see all kinds of suppliers do this. Uh, Continental is probably going to go through a restructuring. We're, we're assuming something like this is going to happen. Bosch, it's last year, sold off its uh, starters and alternators to some Chinese company. So everybody wants to take anything that's got to do with the internal combustion engine and just let put it, it over there. Put it over there. Don't look at that. Look at us. We're the sexy new stuff and give us great stock multiples. And companies that you wouldn't think were within a mile of autonomous features are rebranded themselves as key autonomous partners too right auto leave another one that just split up I mean we're, we're gonna see a whole lot of this mm. stuff mm. well hey great time to take a quick break got to give a shout out to one of our sponsors we got a lot more coming back dr. data we got some inside stuff on the Tesla model 3 that we're going to get to and other topics but first a shout out to our friends at Lear Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back, and with the drum roll, this is the part of the show where it's time for Dr. Data. All right, so this one is going to be incredibly easy, and because uh, I figure, you know, we'll start out the first of the year, and we'll just <laughs> give us a we'll shoot, just give uh, it chance. a real this real is like the Monday New York Times crossword. <laughs> it's just gonna it's it's this is gonna be like the um, the family circle version of the New York Times Sunday or Monday crossword. It's gonna be very easy. So, Carmen, could you please bring up the first slide, please? Okay, so 1.4 million drivers. What could 1.4 million drivers be? Uh, I will guess the number of baby boomers turning 80. That's a frightening thing, but um, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> Todd. Oh, man, this is, the, this is the family circle version? Yeah. <laughs> um, my gosh. Um, 1.4 million drivers are, um, uh, I would just say the opposite, uh, uh, millenn millennials uh, entering the uh, auto market uh, that previously said they weren't interested in cars. Less frightening, but also wrong. <laughs> okay. So, I'm gonna, so John, I, John is looking I, at the back. I, I'm looking at the background, and it's all blurry, but I see a lot of pink. Yes, you do. And pink reminds me of the Lyft mustache, so that's got to be the number of Lyft drivers. And you're right. Oh, oh God. <laughs> wow. So, so, it was, so, uh, so I thought it was very interesting. So, so Lyft put out a thing, and they do this every year, an economic impact report. And they're talking, and, and so, yeah, it's astonishing how many Lyft drivers there are. So, so here are you some other. Call it an impact report, by the way, if you're driving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good Funny. point. They ought to take that into account. Yeah. But there are some other. So, the drivers earned 3.6 billion dollars last year, and that's not including tips. That they gave 375 million rides. Lyft passengers saved 92 million travel hours compared to other transportation. That's a time savings of 3.2 billion dollars. <laughs> now, now, th this is, now, this is where I think that it, it, it becomes even more interesting. And as we were talking about, you know, Ford providing mobility services and, and, you know, so service becomes a thing. So, you know, they queried the people who were taking these rides. 50% used their car less because of Lyft. 21% used public, public transit more because they can connect to it via Lyft. 25% say owning a personal vehicle is less important to them now. Yeah. 25% are saying that. And 83% would 
would request a ride in a self-driving vehicle when the service is available. What percent of those 1.4 million also drive for Uber? Good chunk of know. them. Good chunk. Yeah. I mean, there, there's so much crossover there. There is. Right? Yeah. But I mean, really this, this, this 25% of the people saying that owning a car is less important to them. I oh, mean, yeah. And, That's and, fascinating. And, you know, and so, yeah, and if you think about, like, this is Lyft, and Uber is, you know, is bigger, which means that, you know, conceivably there are more people. And if they were also 25%, I mean, you begin to, to chip away. At car sales. At car sales. And then, you know, and as we, you know, project this year will not be as good in terms of car sales as last year was. So if this accelerates, I mean, it, it could have some, some real implications for our car companies going forward. So, so maybe you just want to sell trucks, Mustangs, and then have the services over here. That's right. That's right. Hey, uh, jumping topics here. I, I want to run a little video clip here in a second. Uh, uh, there's a guy here in town. He's been on After Hours a number of times. We, we have him here every year, and, and we'll get him back, too. Uh, Sandy Monroe of Monroe and Associates. They do a whole lot of stuff. One of the parts of his business is tearing down cars and figuring out how it was engineered and what it cost to engineer it. He just, I was just there yesterday and Carmen was with me. We shot uh, some stuff, but I just wanted to tease a little bit of it because Sandy took me around this car and there's some design issues with the Model 3. And uh, just wanted to show you guys this. Carmen, let's roll, roll that clip. And we, we should point out one other thing, too, here. There's, yeah. uh, in case of an accident, you can't get in under the trunk. There's another place to right. cut the car open, yeah. to cut a cable. But you take it from there, Sandy. You know? I don't know how to do that, and I don't think I'd want to do it. So here we're looking at cutting the cable, probably using a saw. So, so you got to cut through the body here. Yeah, but where? That's the thing. It says you're supposed to cut, there's supposed to be something going on here. How do I know which thing? And I, it tells me I've got to have a buzz saw, but... I mean, where is there? I, I don't know. I personally, if I was in the fire department, I doubt very much if and, I would be the guy. And if you're in the fire department and the trunk's closed, do you even know to go here to That's find this emergency thing. cut right. through? Yeah, I'm certain that lawyers are going to have a, a field day with this kind of stuff. Yeah, so that's just one example. So, so what is it? I, I don't understand. Okay, if a car gets in an accident and now you, you need to use the jaws of life or anything like that, you got to cut the power to the car. And uh, Toyota was the first to step forward when the Prius came out, and they trained like 10,000 emergency personnel all across the country, firemen and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. On, if you got to cut into this car first, you, here's how you disconnect all the power. And uh, we have more video that shows to get under the hood is where you're supposed to do it. But what if you can't get in under the hood? Here's another place. But you gotta take a circular saw and brrr, go through the window in the sheet metal, and then you gotta cut a wire. But if you don't even know about this, uh, it, it's a real danger. And, and the warning label, as I showed, if, if the, the hatch is closed and you just walk up, you don't know where to go into this thing. And uh, as Sandy points out later in the video, in an accident, seconds count. You know, if there's a fire going on in the car, if somebody's badly hurt, you know, seconds count. And mm -hmm. to try to figure out how do I safely, as an EMT, get into this thing, there's some real issues. Is, with is that a, is that a steel car or an aluminum car? I believe it's aluminum, because um, I know that you know, with, with more and more auto companies using advanced high strength steels that the traditional jaws of life don't work so very well oh, yeah. on, on those right. sorts of things. And so uh, they can't the, cut through it. So the steel industry has had to go out just, you know, as you're saying that that Toyota did with the Prius and, and to train, you know, emergency responders how to get into these vehicles that are so safe well, <laughs> because it's, you know, the, the material right. so strong. Well, we'll be showing clips of this all next week on AutoLine Daily. We're still putting this thing together and all. But I just wanted to give you guys a taste and, and the viewers a, a, a taste of some of the things. And uh, when he does his complete teardown, we'll have to get Sandy mm -hmm. in here because I know there's a lot of interest in that car. Uh, very interesting stuff. Yeah, I'd like to see more of that. Uh, hey, if I could make a, a little point, uh, just kind of pedaling back toward the uh, CES Detroit show, um, uh, you can't let it go, Todd. <laughs> no, I can't let it go. Well, I, I, I just wanted to say that there was, it, it, I found it interesting that GM made its announcement about the, uh, what do they call it, the Cruze AV, the fully autonomous car uh, they plan to launch next year. They, they've applied with the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Transportation Department uh, to be able to uh, deploy that, uh, not for purchase, but as uh, kind of a robo-taxi, 
take people around town that you know uh, c considering the that they announced it right between ces and the detroit auto show i know that their big announcement on that saturday was the the chevy silverado pickup truck but they should have they should have had a concept version of that car to show say tuesday at at the auto show that would have been the perfect time to do that and God, not only that do it at ces if ces is the place to go with news like that too but see I mean, I this, think would, that raises this would bring that the, sort of everything about the timing is questionable right that would bring that sort of thing uh to detroit when detroit uh, along with la and the other auto shows are trying to change into this auto mobility thing and and kind yeah, but of gm's not a, trying to help the detroit show they're trying to help themselves of course so, the, I so i mean that. where do, where, where was the best place for the bang for, for the buck in, in their view I, yeah and i don't I'm understand not sure, that choice would they would yeah. they have been uh top of the news at ces whereas no i don't think so i yeah. i'm i'm I, I think it's a really interesting question you raise yeah but it, didn't they but they, they just sent out a news release and had like three sentences and i mean it right. had no it right. had no it was and they just showed a picture yeah. of a uh in you know in, in Interior buck. Still, it would have been like, easy to put that interior. There's a buck with, yeah. with no. Yeah. No, no, no. There, there, there is a car. There is a car because I, I went to uh, a party Friday night that GM held at the Rensen at its headquarters. They do a pre-party before the charity preview at the Detroit Show. Oh, right, Auto right. Show. And they had the buck it's there. It's a good party too. Yeah. They had the bloody car there. I would really? love to. Yes, so there. Love to. And that's Why what people were saying. It? What's it doing at the party? It should no be over kidding. a Kobo. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I presume it was probably basically a Chevy Bolt with that interior, yes, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And, and in fact, while we've been talking here, Joe Lazio uh, wrote in to say, with all the talk of autonomous cars, you'd think that someone would build a concept car that takes advantage of the packaging that no longer requires a steering wheel or conventional dashboard. Well, and, and a few have. Mercedes had the concept a couple of years ago. They showed a it. Giant vehicle. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was their, their concept vision or whatever. But it had a retractable steering wheel. Oh, yeah. And, and I was on uh, a local program here, uh, Let It rip uh, with Ed Welburn and Ed you know who used to run GM design he says he can't wait he's dying for somebody to give him a project to design the interior of an autonomous car and he said look the bolt without the steering wheel and all that that's fine but all you did was take an existing car and remove that stuff. You didn't yeah. design the car as Joe Lazio writing in here says take advantage of that packaging space well, and some of the early design studies you know, had no windows, and now we're finding out that all the research from apparently decades of motion study is that if people are moving around in a sealed box, everybody gets car sick because you can't look out at the, hori at the horizon. It would be unpleasant, a whole sealed box full of people car sick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With no windows, right. <laughs> but somebody, uh, one of the universities or some, I, I, I'm catching up still on all my press releases, they, they've come up with a technology that uses some sort of light in the car to get, so if you're rearward facing, and that's where a lot of other people get car sick, you know, they're facing in the rear, and, but this gives you a, like a horizon that your eye can focus on and give you relationship, blah, 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 and they say, it works wonderfully well in re uh, reducing wow. car sickness. I think this gets to the core of a bigger societal issue, and that's that, um, you know, I don't have any kids, but I hear about how uh, people with kids have to have rear seat entertainment systems for them that uh, if they're not on those rear seat entertainment systems, they'll be constantly looking at their smartphones or whatever. Why don't you want to look out the window anymore? I mean, you know, yeah, maybe you're maybe every day you're going to the same place and you're going to see more or less the same thing, but you're going to see different people. Nobody wants to look outside anymore. Yeah, and get off my lawn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. I mean, when, when, you were on a family, when you were a kid on a family vacation, didn't you spend most of your time in, in, in the car with your nose buried in a book, though? Or, or was no, that just me? I, okay, that was just well, me. Well, on a vacation, <laughs> if I was going to uh, a new place, I certainly wanted to see what was outside. Okay. I might have a book along, but I, I didn't have to read it for the entire drive. Oh, man. I, I Look, I come from a big family, and we spent the whole time fighting. There you go. You're sitting on my part of the seat. No, I'm not. Move over. You know, and uh, I wish we had those entertainment systems. <laughs> a, Your parents would when my kids were kids, and when I was a kid. Yeah. Okay. I'm all for it. All right. So we've been talking about all this autonomous stuff and CES stuff, but okay, so there was that big auto show, and, and Mark, I know that you spent probably an inordinate <laughs> amount of time at that show. Okay, so so Tell me what you saw that really impressed you in Detroit. Um, 
you, you got to just give a shout out to the 68 Bullet because it was the car in the movie that had been lost for 40 years and it's back and there's a great family story to it. So th there's that. So this is the Steve McQueen car. The car for that the... Steve McQueen drove so still with the old. Them, yep. um, still, actually, the other one I don't think he actually drove much, but it was used in the in the chase scenes. In but anyway, stunts. yeah, right. in the stunts. Yeah. So, they, so Ford brought that there because they're introducing a new bullet. A new bullet. Yeah, and, and the new bullet is nice, but I mean, it, it's the out. fact of That's there the we go, bullet. the yeah. old one and. And it's unrestored. It still has the old camera mounts welded underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know got tape notes on the inside that were to, to McQueen when he was driving. So, so I mean that's fantastic. Um, but I would say to, to the point that I think Todd was making earlier, it was great to be at, a, at an auto show and see some actual concept vehicles too. So because what? Because there's been a real dearth of, of good concept, far out concept vehicles. The Lexus LF1, um, great looking uh, exterior design for a luxury SUV. Nice proportion. Small, small SUV. Yeah, and, and I well, think that when they said that it was, but but they said it was a flagship, and I think they're kind of overselling it because I think it's it, it's it clearly looks smaller than like a. BMW X7 or an Audi Q8. smaller than an RX, a yeah. Lexus RX. It, it, I understand it's it yeah. basically uh, more or less on a, on a GS platform. Yeah. So, where, where was the design? Was that out of Japan or out of Kelty? Yeah. Okay, California. And and I got some. Oh, here we got a picture of it. And yeah. And That's another thing too, shoe. I got to say, the color is cool. Yeah. yeah. It's this copper. You know, peach, rosé, champagne combination. That's really nice. And in the picture, it looks longer, I think, than yeah, it, yeah, than it yeah, is yeah, in reality. Right. Well, but it, it, it has that long hood, um, almost a shooting brake look to it. I mean, uh, you know, I just got back from the uh, Buick uh, uh, Regal Tourex drive and Mark's driving one. And, you know, it, it has those sorts of proportions. Now, the, the Tourex is really a, a wagon. But this is like a slightly raised wagon. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've got some hints that, uh, you know, as like almost everybody else, uh, Lexus needs to pare down its sedan lineup. And, uh, you know, this could fit in between an IS and an LS with no need for a new GS, which they, they don't sell any of those. So, so what other concepts, Mark? Um, the Infinity Q Inspiration that was is very breathtaking. And it's and a very nice interior, and it's got the most exciting new engine that was at the show, the uh, Infiniti QX Turbo, sorry, VX Turbo, VC uh, Turbo, a variable compression. It had an engine in it. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a turbo, by God, yeah. the VC Turbo, a variable compression uh, turbocharged engine that can run, the, the displacement can vary from something like 1.8 to 2.5 liters, something like that. Really dramatic, um, and, and compression ratios change, and the mechanical linkage to do it mm -hmm. is fascinatingly weird. We, also. Need, we need Frank Marcus to explain yeah. all that. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, and then there was the uh, Nissan Cross, cross Motion. Cross well, there's motion. the letter X and the word Motion, but we must say it's the Cross Motion. They See, that's why you were looking for VX for an engine name. <laughs> You're not used to a new thing not having an X in it. Yeah. So, so what did you think about? I mean, I was I was a little eh, about the design of that vehicle. The I, exterior I found very interesting because Nissan. I mean, they, they make the Rogue and they make the Murano, right? And they understood the shift to SUVs and populated their lineup with a lot of them earlier than anybody else. So I think we have to take this style seriously as an idea of what they're thinking seriously about next uh, in the next generation the interior was just silly i thought well and, and to your point that that's that's about the size of a of a rogue and but then the question is are people buying the crossover style suvs because they want something that looks like an suv or are, are they buying them because they're more car-like. Uh, are people really interested in something more rugged-looking just to say, hey, I've got an SUV? I don't know. I'm not that's sure the that's... Question. And will it be something that kind of cycles, like there are cycles in minivans, that for yeah. minivans go jelly bean, then they go more you know, upright. Exactly. Are, are SUVs you know, going to go through that same kind of exactly. rotation? Exactly. So, so there's the, the bizarre-ish uh, interior that... Is, is up there. So yeah. across, I the, across the top of the IP is a long screen, so it's an, an entire screen there. And, uh, and the I think that's the, I think they had that. Oh, wait, which one is this? That's the cross motion. The cross, the cross motion, Nissan. okay. Uh, 
at CES, they had that same kind, they had a concept car. I, I don't know if it was the same concept cars. It wasn't because it was embargoed. Okay. This one was embargoed until the time of the release, okay. I believe. Yeah. But anyway, uh, one cool aspect of technology with that panorama of screens atop, uh, uh, on the top of the dash is uh, they're going to use augmented reality. So even if the road is completely covered in snow, the screens will show you exactly where the road is as if it were a sunny summer day. Mm. And uh, that's pretty cool technology, I think. Especially Which reminds me, the other, because there was some uh, VC, you know, uh, eyewash in the, uh, in the concept <laughs> car, reminds me, I think the other big piece of news from Detroit was the GAC announcement that it will uh, bring its first Chinese-built, Chinese-branded Guangzhou car. Guangzhou Auto Company. Uh, yes, uh, which goes, which uses the, the brand name in China of Trump Chi. No, no kidding, and they've had that name for 10 or 12 years or something like that. So presumably they'll come up with a new name, a new brand name for the U.S. Uh, market, unless they just call it GAC. Uh, but they will bring a, what, a three-row SUV will be the first model launching in the last quarter of 2019. And uh, I, I talked to Michael Dunn about it, and he said, yes, they're very serious and that they do have uh, the, they're, they're getting the certification uh, in motion uh, to make sure that that vehicle can come to the U.S. So it's a little issue of getting dealers first before they And, and that, for that. one model to that point. And so, but... Um, They've I, got a joint venture in China with uh, Fiat Chrysler. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, you know, that might be... Yeah, Fiat dealers network. could certainly use another model no matter what it is. And, you know. and, and a number of others, too. Honda being one of them. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the GAC builds cars for a bunch of, yep. you know... Japanese, European, right. and uh, American brands. And to that point, the, the, the execs from GAC also are attending uh, the uh, National Auto Dealers Association meeting Ooh, uh, this year uh, just to meet people. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey look, there, there's more that we can talk about at NAIAS, but we got to take a quick break right now because we got to give a shout out to our good friends at Bridgestone. Okay, we're back talking all things automotive. And uh, we were talking about the Detroit Auto Show. One thing that caught my eye was that Acadie's engine on the floor. And what really caught my eye was that it was Aramco, the Saudi Arabian oil company, that bought exhibit space and put this engine in there with an F-150 mounted. It, it, it mounted in an F-150. And they're claiming they're going to get 37 miles to the gallon combined fuel economy with this thing. And so this is the opposed piston engine, and we had David Johnston, David Johnson on, right. on the show here before. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's basically an internal combustion engine with a different architecture than we're familiar with. Right. So making the argument that, you know, you don't need a hybrid, you don't need an EV, that you're, you don't need, even need a diesel. You can do it, run it on gasoline. and. Uh, so there's a lot of skepticism out there. There's a picture of the engine. It's and just like an engine. A lot of skepticism, but David told me, Gary, he's going to make this engine and that truck available for you and I to drive, and we'll bring it in the studio here. We'll do a whole show about it. But uh, David also said, uh, so I said, so is there any interest in it? He goes, oh, yeah, interest is really picked up. He said there's one North American, big North American manufacturer that is showing a lot of interest. So I mentioned that GM party that I was at, the pre uh, charity preview thing. I ran into, uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name now, who's the, the VP of powertrain? Uh, Sorry, I'm blanking. I, I can see his face and I can't yeah, think about yeah. it. But anyway, I asked him, Dan Nicholson? Yes. Yeah, Dan Nicholson. So I asked Dan, what do you think about the Acadies engine? Long pause, it's interesting. So I asked, would you be interested in something like that? He said, it's interesting. <laughs> so It should be noted for what, uh, what they did show in the, in the Chevy Silverado or talk about. They didn't show the, the engines exactly, but uh, a new uh, variable uh, cylinder engine that can shut down to, from eight cylinders to one cylinder or anything in between. Is that the Delphi the skip fire yeah, I, technology? No, no, they said that it's a, a, a West Coast uh, company that well, developed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I forget who. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. you're right, but I believe Delphi bought that company or mm -hmm. bought the, or, or I, I think Delphi owns oh. the technology. Not Aptiv? Even, <laughs> not, not Aptiv. This would be, no. be Delphi Technologies. That was yeah, the other right. company. So okay. there was, yeah. and, and also the, uh, the inline six-cylinder uh, diesel. All right, so, yeah. so okay. Right. Could, could I ask a question? Could you pronounce the name of this new engine again? Because I've never been clear on it. Hades. Thank you very it much. It looks like H8s. Yeah, I keep 
I, I, I always stumble over. I think Achates is some Greek mythological figure. Somebody in the chat room would look it up and let us know. <laughs> All right, so we've got these, you, you two here. Silverado Ram. What do you guys think? I mean, this, the, those are fun. big, in, you know, big introductions. It's going to be a lot people. of fun to watch. So, so what do you think? Um, rat, um, well, I, I've got to bet with some people that the 2018 model year Ram will outsell the Silverado. Uh, sorry, 2019. So the uh, new one. Yes, the new one will outsell the new model year Silverado, largely just because it's going to be on sale three months earlier. Okay. Uh, but uh, there's another reason why. Yeah. Because they are devoting an entirely new assembly plant to making rams. It's not a new plant. What I'm saying, they converted the, the Sterling Heights plant that had been making the Chrysler 200. Now it's going to make rams. So I figure 200,000, 220,000 additional sales. Uh, they and, could. Yeah. And ram finished behind the Silverado roughly 100,000 units. So you're getting 200,000 more. So I'm saying it's got a shot, but GM's not sitting on its hands. It's retooling the, one of the Asha plants in Canada to start assembling trucks again. They, they should get another 60,000 Silverados. And I think in the long run, I, you know, I don't think uh, Fiat Chrysler, uh, they would love to be number one in pickup trucks, sure, but I think they'd be happy to be number three as long as the number goes up. They sold half a million last year. Uh, the, uh, in the long term, it may be that Ram helps uh, Chevrolet pass, f pass Ford in sales uh, because they take away some Ford sales. They, they both have newer trucks. That would be a dream. I mean, the, the delta between a, a, well, if, okay, let, anybody else's. Well, wait a minute. But let's say, let's say the delta between a Chevy with GMC combined uh, <laughs> would, uh, might be able to catch them. And, and I think uh, that's happened in the reasonably recent past. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, it, it is two different brands. And, and uh, um, yeah, and, and uh, Chevy took 450 pounds out of the truck. Uh, uh, Ram took something like, what was it, 225 or 275? 25, I believe. 25, okay, right. so you, you brought up another good one. George from Sunnyvale wrote in to say, with the Silverado losing 450 pounds, could it be lighter than the F-150? Oh, I, it could. Because when the, when the F-150 lost 700 pounds, that was 700 pounds off of what was already the heaviest truck uh, among those three, right, and uh, and and so the difference. I, I don't know exactly what it is. You have to go truck by truck, all those different configurations. But I, I would think uh, the Chevy could be lighter. Yeah, and George, just so you know, too, uh, GM or Chevrolet have not given us what the truck weighs. All they did was tell us how much weight they took out of it. They're saving to give us all the details later in the year. Right, and and by the way, uh, since Gary mentioned, uh, you looked at both of us about who's going to win this thing, uh, or which one we prefer. Uh, my, my gut reaction leans a little bit toward the Ram, in part because they did a better job on interiors. The interiors. Yes. The Chevy dropped the, the ball on, on interiors. The, the other thing that... Did uh, they again, do you think? Because I, I honestly... I was what so I saw, of course, these are pre-production, yeah. but... And, and I was just fascinated by the amount of work that went into the bed on the Silverado, yeah. and it's amazing how, how much more useful that's going to be to people. But I barely looked at the inside of yeah. the Silverado, I have to admit. I, I, it wasn't a huge disappointment, but it, it was a disappointment in that it didn't seem to move forward the way the, the Ram I, I did. I think, Todd, you're, you're calling it a disappointment because the Ram was so good. Yeah. Spectacular yeah. interior. And that massive touchscreen, too. Right. Which apparently was developed for the originally, when they were thinking about a police pursuit version of the Charger, they wanted to have a you know, full-size touchscreen so that you know, they wouldn't have to do aftermarket mountings of laptops. Yeah. I would bet since, uh, what, a week or two ago that uh, Chevy interior designers are halfway to a refresh on that already. <laughs> right. um, one other observation about the Ram. You know, if you go back to, I think it was 1994, when they, they first started calling it Ram, and they, they, they were the first guys to go big, massive grill, blunt, flat front end, crosshairs in the grill. And now it, it, there's two grills on, on the Ram. There's uh, sort of the, like the mainstream one, and then there's the, the Rebel. The Rebel still looks like uh, the current truck, but if you look at the other grill, it's a lot smaller. I agree, and, and I, that's there's a nice. lot more plan view, i.e., a lot more rounded front end. Uh, they they taper off the the hood at the end there, yeah. and and they saved that. They did a lot of 
things for aerodynamics. For aero. And I, I think that's a, n a nice, refreshing uh, flip on, uh, on that thing. Let me say something, too, about uh, midsize trucks, because uh, Sergio Marchione said at his annual uh, Detroit Show Roundtable, and this will be his last since he's uh, going to be retiring from Fiat Chrysler, that uh, they still can't do a business model for a new Dodge Dakota, or Ram Dakota, it would be called now. But they, those are lifestyle trucks, and they've got one coming. They've got the Jeep uh, Scrambler. I, and I think that's why he's saying I can't do a, uh, a business case. Yeah. Because then Ram would compete with Jeep. Jeep's perfect for that. And he doesn't so, yeah. have to do a business case. Right. He's got it already. Yeah, right. Hey, we got a, a bunch of things you guys want to run. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, viewer mail that's come in here, uh, comments and, and viewer mail. So let's see. Uh, uh, S10 Baja, do, do we think Tesla is doomed? Yes. Yes and no. Because of Elon's new uh, um, his pay stock. Uh, well, yeah, set. but um, uh, the... the uh, Wall Street analysts that I kind of skim and, and the, the, the one or two that I, um, uh, um, that, that I think are, are smart about it, uh, one of them says uh, Tesla is going to continue to lose money, but don't uh, buy Tesla stock short. Yeah, because don't the, short it. The, the, yeah, don't short it. The uh, right. the the the, the, the uh, profits will. Uh, I mean, the losses will keep going up, and so will the stock value. Okay, Barry Rector says, now that you've seen the three trucks from GM, Ford, and Ram, who's the leader in the truck wars? Wow, um, I think uh, technically uh, there's a real strong shot for uh, Silverado mm -hmm. in terms of capability, fuel economy, everything. I agree. I think, uh, you know, the, the all-aluminum uh, body was a, a great idea at the time, but uh, for the reaction for Ford, for the Ford F-150, which has been the leader for so long, uh, but I think uh, it, it's their position to lose, and I think they may lose it uh, within a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't think they, I, I don't think they will lose it in my working life. The, the sales position? And I'm hoping so, not to be fired this year. Nah. <laughs> so, so just just for I, 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 those I watching think, at home. Yeah. So this past year they sold um, 897,000 F-Series yeah. trucks, and um, General Motors sold 586,000 Silverados. Okay. But but to but, Todd's point but earlier, add the GMC. Add, add the GMC, I, and, and that closes the gap. And Ford will still be able to time. say we are the leader because it's by brand, no question. Right. right. But. Okay. Um, but if yeah. you throw in the midsize yeah, but, yeah, but pickups, then GMC GM is a total is, is different. Or yeah, GM is a total, and midsize is different too. And how many Rangers will they sell? I mean, that's such a totally unknown question. I think. that's true. It's, yeah, it's going to be difficult because you know the midsize truck segment has doubled in size since GM got back into it, but last year it went up only one percent. In the last three months of last year, Honda Ridgeline sales dropped twenty five percent. That's a big drop for what is essentially a new truck. And now Jeep's going to get in, Ford's getting in, uh, Hyundai's going to get in. It's going to be a The Honda's an outlier because they did the same thing with the original Ridge line and then settled in around twelve to 18000 per year for the rest of that first-generation truck's uh, life cycle. Yeah, but they didn't do a new version of it to sell 18000 a year. Yeah, right. You know, they, they, they were hoping for a, sust a sustainable 50 or 60. Okay, related right. to this, uh, Ray Mitrowitz asks, as all these trucks and off-roading body-on-frame vehicles are coming into view, what do you think about GM's decision to make the new Blazer a front-drive unibody crossover? Well, that's basically going to be a Ford Edge competitor. That's, that's what they're bringing the nameplate back for. Yep. You know, and do they, do they need a Bronco competitor? We won't know until we see how well the Ford Bronco does, but yeah. I, I would say probably not. Uh, James Earl Moans wants to know, should I even attend the New York Auto Show? Oh, New York's, I, I generally don't go because of a vacation conflict, but looking at the coverage, I think New York's generally a good show. There's always uh, a fair amount of uh, new vehicles being introduced, um, and I think there's going to be a, a pretty good showing by the luxury brands this year. Yeah. If you're not committed to the Jeep Easter Jamboree, yes, definitely go to the New York Auto Show. Okay, Mac Ford Fan 98 tweeted this in. Have you guys ever have you guys driven or tested any newly released vehicles? Ford EcoSport, any others? Not the well, you just got uh, back from the cross tour. Yeah, the the uh, Torx. Yeah. Tour uh, believe me, I have trouble keeping all that straight too. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the Buick, Buick uh, Regal Torx, and and I can talk about it. I I think it's a. Uh, 
uh, perfectly nice executed um, what they would like to call a crossover. I think they could have just called it the Buick Sport Wagon. I think it's got nice proportions. It's smooth. It's quiet, relatively quiet. The two-liter turbo engine is plenty powerful. It's not a driver's car by any means, but then again, neither is, say, the Volvo V90 Cross Country, and it's in that ilk uh, for less money and certainly, you know, not as nice an interior. Yeah, almost exactly the same size and almost 20 grand less. I, I, I happen to be driving Here's the one, picture too. of it right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, looks like a million. I, th I think it, it looks better in your driveway than it does in photos, and I think yeah. it photographs well. No, yeah. it does. Um, it's a good looking I, car. I really like it. Tons this, of space, their, too. Their demonstration for us was uh, if you want, uh, try to put a mountain bike on top of this car, and, you know, that's the difference between, you know, the, the, the height of this is actually, I looked it up, is about the same height as a 1968 Buick Sport Wagon. Uh, something like 58 uh, inches and change, and a Buick Enclave is 69 inches and change. And uh, you, you lift a kayak up on top of that, or a, or a mountain bike, or whatever, and there's a big difference uh, in this thing. So there may be more sport in this sport utility, uh, and other vehicles like this. Now, the one thing I would like, I'm, I always, I'm going to beat on my dead horse about how Buick should have had a rear drive car. And as good as those proportions are, they would have looked even better with rear drive, and it would have been a little more fun to drive. Isn't that the Opal? Yeah, it yes. is. It's the Opal. So Buick really didn't design it. So no, and uh, well, I, at that time Buick Peugeot. design and uh, Opal were pretty close. Yeah, I mean, linked. yeah, yeah. Uh, so now it's uh, so now they have to rely on. They've got a contract with uh, Peugeot Citroen to build it, um, but you know what happens after, let's say, a five-year life cycle. I think, what I think the contract for three years. Yeah, I, no. that'd be what I'd guess. I'll be, I, I drove one couple of hundred, about 250 miles yesterday to uh, pick up a new puppy that I was adopting, and I loved the car. Uh, and I, Yeah, and I loved the puppy. Um, no picture of the puppy, sadly. Uh, but <laughs> I'll be really interested when you drive one on the roads around here yeah. to see if you still think that, that about the quiet, because uh, road noise is, is I, I have very, very few quibbles with it at this point, but road noise is potentially one. Uh, good, good point. And, and I noticed uh, because we drove it from Phoenix to Sedona and back uh, that in Phoenix on the rougher roads, it felt fairly stiff given that it's not, uh, given that it, it's fairly soft in the corners. Um, and I'm surprised it doesn't have a driving mode selector, frankly. The other thing is, do you have a pre-production or do you have a production car? So, so this is funny. Uh, Buick uh, quiet tuning includes uh, uh, foam insulation on the tires. And uh, the pre-production cars we drove don't have that foam insulation. The uh, production cars, which they're, apparently they've already sold a few, uh, the ones in the dealers uh, should have those tires. Apparently they couldn't. Ooh, because that would play to your account about road I have to find out about that. Thank yeah. you. I will ask Buick about that. Yeah, yeah and I'll check the VIN. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Usually you can tell uh, without the insulation in the tires, and it's really a damping on uh, the wheel, uh, you can hear almost a, a, a ring. Mm -hmm. An echoing ring mm. from yeah. the tires, if it doesn't. Well, and have I, and I was thinking there's some wind noise as well, but there was some stuff that I was definitely attributing to tire noise, mm. which is probably that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, but I will definitely try to find that out. Thank you for, okay. for mentioning it. And then speaking of, because he asked about, have you driven anything? You, you guys just got back from driving uh, the redesign of the Cherokee. Can't comment on it. <laughs> oh, we had a piece Embargo? of online daily I, today. You can't do driving Embargo. driving impressions, yeah, which I can't say. Okay. That's embargoed. That's yeah. embargoed. Yeah. It looks nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. New, new it's got headlamps. A new front fascia. Yeah. It's got a new rear fascia. Sure. It's. Uh, well. I, I will take a moment of the time that uh, Gary could have spoken about that to say that the reason that I've got the Tour X here in Detroit is because I'm testing GM's Marketplace e-commerce app, uh, which uh, makes it easy for you to do things with Priceline, you know, book hotels on your route, uh, have an order waiting for you at Dunkin' Donuts, you know, that kind of thing. And it's very early, so they don't have many apps yet. But it, you can see a pathway to that being a really useful service yeah. as they add more features. See, to get, get back to my get off my lawn uh, type comments, uh, do we really need that? Do we really need so much of that? I, I can see, okay, you know, do you, having your coffee ready uh, when you arrive at 
Starbucks, but I can't stand Starbucks. So, you know. That's why it's Dunkin' Donuts, right? It's yeah. Dunkin oh, they're, they're adding Starbucks, Starbucks oh, to the books okay. as well, but Dunkin' yeah. Donuts is the one that's working now. We got uh, yeah. uh, more stuff. Uh, Jose okay. D says, these old farts are complaining about where to cut the power to the car. LOL, bunch of morons. Fire department has the documents for every model. I know this because I work at a fire department. Manufacturers give books on every car, including Tesla. Okay, Jose, prove it. Prove it to me. Fax me a copy. Fax me a copy on the Tesla Model 3. And I'll give you our fax number right now. Get a pencil out. Give you a moment. 734-542-7014. Fax me it. And if it's true, we'll be talking about this next week. I'll bet you can't do it. But prove me wrong. Okay. We also got a phone call here. Let's bring that one in. Hey guys, great show, great show. Um, I got a question for you. Now that Gax at the Detroit Auto Show and Chinese manufacturers are going to begin to ship products to America, how come we aren't taxing, putting a tariff on their cars shipping into the U.S. of 25% from China? Like China charges a 25% tariff for American built vehicles being shipped to China. Anyways, great show. Uh, by the way, the Corvette C8 CAD drawing show a dual clutch transmission and an LT1, LT4 derivative in the CAD drawings that are uh, all over the internet. Just heads up for next year's Detroit show. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Jonathan. Much appreciated. Uh, uh, tariffs. I, you know, yeah. I mean, I... I I guess the Trump administration wants to re renegotiate those. Um, the, the other side of that coin is that, you know, that would obviously add a uh, great size tariff to the Buick and in, uh, Envision. Uh, and the Volvo, and the Volvo S90, I believe. Yeah. 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 The, uh, the, but, but it gets e even more than that. It, it's, it's basic you know, philosophy. Um, you know, U.S. You know, economic philosophy is that we don't believe in really high tariffs. All cars brought in get a 2.5% uh, uh, tariff on them. Uh, so China pays the same as a, as a car from Germany, basically. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, they could, if they wanted to, uh, slap a, a, a higher one on China. But, you know, we do so much business with China that I think they'll have, they, they would have a hard time getting that through Congress. Well, cars they, are they did so much costlier there to begin with. This week, yeah. so... And that was like 25%. Well, but number one. At, at, at any rate, Ford's not going to move focus production back to Mexico and then back to the U.S. if, <laughs> yeah. if that uh, happens. I or kind Florida. of agree with Jonathan, but just to clear up a few things here, uh, we do charge an import tariff on every car that comes into this country of 2.5%, not the 25% that China charges. But we do charge a 25% tariff on every truck, which is why we don't import any trucks and why the big three are still in business because they make all their profit on their trucks. <laughs> so I'm kind of with you, though. Uh, China forces every automaker to find a Chinese partner if they want to build cars in China. Otherwise, you face the 25 percent import tariff. And I, I'm kind of a free trade guy, but I'm also in favor of reciprocity. If a country's taking an advantage of you, say, hey, great idea, guys. You charge 25%, so will we. You want to partner with a manufacturer, so do we. We're going to borrow your rules and apply them here. I don't see why there's anything wrong with that. I really don't. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't think we have to worry about Chinese cars flooding this market for... Anytime. At least three years. <laughs> well, you know, no, I, I mean, I mean, the the, the you know the stuff that uh, Guangzhou Auto had on their stand, none of it looked competitive. The GS, the current version of the GS8, and it's the next generation. Apparently, they're going to bring here. Looked like you couldn't give it away if you people were comparing it to a Ford Explorer or a Toyota Highlander. But I think we underestimate them at our peril. Totally agree, Mark. And so uh, I ran into Hao Tai Tang, head of product development and purchasing at Ford. And we were right at the GAC stand where you could see, uh, which was right across the aisle from GMC. So GMC, GAC, one letter apart. And he pointed out the big three row SUV in the GAC stand and then pointed to one at the GMC stand and said the Chinese one's going to be $5,000 cheaper. So uh, to your right, to your point. Don't underestimate them. I would be worried most if I were Mitsubishi, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, which has kind of rebuilt its business in the U.S. Uh, from 25,000 units a few years ago to about 100,000 last year. 
basically on the Outliner and Outlander uh, support. Okay, two more two more questions. Scott in Cleveland says, "Have any of you ever attended the Detroit uh, Auto Show during public days?" Yes. 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 Yeah. Never again. <laughs> along with CES. <laughs> ah, ah, no Detroit public days. No CES. That's my rule. Too too jam packed. Uh, last year, actually, well, actually, last year was my I think third time in 22 years because. Ford with this Mustang thing had us come down on the on Tuesday of public days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Sorry, it was awful. And I, I'll say I I don't go to public days very often, but I love going on public days because in the media days we're all so snarky and cynical. It's like oh look, you know they blew this here and you know they they uh, they, they should have sold more Who's exhibits there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you go to the public days and man, the buzz is so good. Everybody's so happy. They're so cheerful. I I, I like going to the public days. But it's uh, uh, not every year. Well, but and I get spoiled because you know there's so much more. Even though there's a huge crowd around each press conference as it happens, you can walk around the the uh, whole press floor and you know, have a vehicle to yourself. Twenty minutes later, yeah. and we get really spoiled during press days. But that's not to say that the public days are not you know the best day of the week for a lot of the people who go oh, there. Yeah. I agree, and yeah. uh, obviously and people keep showing up and. Uh, I, I just don't, I, I, I hope Detroit doesn't turn into a Chicago where it's mostly a, a public show. Uh, we, we have some things to see in Chicago, but it's, it's very quiet compared with Detroit. I'd like for Detroit to still be the, uh, the premier U.S. show. Okay, one last question. Comes in from our uh, friend and colleague, John Warniak, who's the vice president of vehicle technology for SEMA. He says, what's going to be the impact of ADAS, all these advanced driver assist things? What's going to be the impact of ADAS and autonomous technology on the performance aftermarket? That's a brilliant That question. should be our question to him, I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I'm well, autonomous is going to, you know, autonomy is not about performance. You know, autonomy is going to be about comfort, I think. You but know. they're not mutually uh, um, incompatible either. Correct. I mean, you know, vehicles that have uh, all the assistance systems and all the future autonomy, there, there will be Porsches built that have all of that, and then you will be able to drive it like a Porsche. Yeah. But how the two, how, in, how performance is import, improved or amplified by those, I, I haven't given it much thought. Yeah. I, I, I'm just thinking of like uh, the Bliss, the, the blind spot systems on the, on the uh, Autobahn when you're in the middle lane and uh, Porsche is coming at you from the left lane at 155 or something like that. Uh, maybe you need a better Bliss or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, and it could be just like you know, other driving systems you know, ad adapt to, to your style. It could be that some of the features that are built into the, the driver assistance uh, 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 systems will also adapt to your style. And I would guess that autonomous systems will allow, will allow for some level of tailoring for how closely do you want to follow and, and, and things like that also. Hey, I, I just got a message from the control room. Jose did send a PDF. So we, we don't have time to check it out now, but thank you for doing so, Jose. And you may prove me wrong, and I will eat humble crow here on the program next week, if it's true. <laughs> but anything else, or we should wrap this up? I'm good. <laughs> We solved all the world's automotive problems. I think time time to go home, or a good or a good chunk of them. Well, good. Well, Gary, we're going to do this next week. Indeed, good chunk next week too. Okay. Thanks everybody for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. I don't know. I mean, because Good question. That, that, could be said, question. that could be Good said for... If you have yeah, that on every car, that could be said for said wrong. cutting open a Chevy Volt or a, a Bolt or a, you know, a Nissan Leaf or something. Or well, like I said, I, I know both uh, Toyota and GM trained, I, I want to say each of them trained 10,000 EMTs yeah. across the country. You know, sea to shining sea kind yeah, of a thing. Yeah. 
saying, here's how you safely cut into this car. So the last thing we want is an EMT getting electrocuted. So I, mean, I guess I want to understand about, so in the Model 3, they have a sticker that says cut here. But yeah. it's a sticker you can't see. There's, but I mean, <laughs> does, does any other car have a thing that says cut here? Any other electric car? Not yeah. to my knowledge. I haven't seen that sticker anywhere else. No. no. So and, and aren't they just doing a service? Well, again, it's a sticker that you can't see unless the trunk is open, so I'm not sure how big a service it is. And then I think the point is when the trunk was open, he, uh, uh, he couldn't figure out... Uh, yeah, they were ambiguous. Where, where do you cut it, here? It's you sort know? of in like... In which direction? You know. Right. Do, do you go right in this way, or is it two inches over, or whatever? And then, you know, you just got a narrow slit. You know, you're going to have to cut out more if you want to get your hand in there to grab some wire to cut. Mm. But what, what triggered it is uh, there is... Uh, the real place to cut the power is under the hood, but there is no mechanical release for the hood. So oh. if, uh, of course there's, there's a button a on, on the, the center screen, uh, because everything's controlled by the center screen, which is pretty cool. There, there's, there are good aspects to this car. So you hit the button, but if the screen's been knocked out in the accident, or the power's been knocked out in the accident, now you gotta go on the, the front fascia, there's this punch through, that you got to punch out, reach in, pull out a couple of cables, attach them to a 12 volt battery, and that will pop the hood. And now you can go in and cut the wire <laughs> so it's safe to go inside. So you have to give it some electricity to pop the hood and cut the right. electricity. Because there's, there's no mechanical hey, can't release. You, can't you just cut through the hood? Yeah, you could. If you know that's where it is, I think, doesn't that become part of the question, whether people know where, to, where, where the wiring well, is? Th that's the danger. When you start going through, do you know exactly where to cut through, and what if you hit this very high voltage line and as then, you're cutting through the hood? And then you have all that cutting to do before you get to cutting the, 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 the passenger compartment where you can actually get people out. I mean, again, yeah. that gets Or are we to, getting people out? <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, again, that gets to the, you know, seconds do count in this case. Well, as Gary pointed out, you know, this ultra high strength, hot stamp steel, right. most jaws of life can't cut through it. And so what EMTs are doing now is you go through the sunroof, if there's a sunroof, or you kick out the windshield, or you go through the backlight. So if you don't have the jaw, you got to get brand new jaws of life that can actually cut through the steel. Yeah, because they're using it for like B pillars and yeah, and you know the the, the rings on the side to uh, think mm -hmm. thinking the way that uh, Elon Musk thinks. I'm I'm guessing he should start looking at ejector seats. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean start? <laughs> <laughs> Well, good. Good show, guys. Thank this you. This was fun. It was a lot of fun. Well, it was enjoyable.